Hey guys, Mark here with Hockey Culture Training and Systems again. This is part two of the six part mini series where I dive into the history and identity of hockey's big six. And today, we're looking at the spectacular Swedes who have won the worlds in 53, 57, 62, 87, 92, 98, 06, 13, and 17, as well as the golds in 94, 2006 Olympics. Boasting at all time greats like Lee Pumfist or Folke Janssen, Anders Andersen, Roland Stoltz, Sven Dumba, Ulf Sterner, Lennart Svedberg, Matt Sundin, Peter Forsberg, Borje Salming, Bengt Ake Gustafsson, Nicholas Lidstrom, Mats Neslin, Daniel Affletson, Henrik Zetterberg, and Henrik Lundqvist. I think my sweet friends would uh, be pretty pissed off at that pronunciation. Anyway, uh, and while the Swedes are considered an elite hockey nation today, that wasn't always the case. Like most European nations, in the early 1900s, the number one sport in the winter was banned. Think of uh, field hockey on ice. Um, and according to a doctoral dissertation titled The People's Home on Ice by Tobias Stark, it wasn't until 1914 where ice hockey became a thing. According to the story, three men met at a local cafe. One of those men was Raoul Lemat. Uh, I think he was like a French-American filmmaker who basically moved to Sweden to open a theater. He was a retired hockey player from there, and when he came over, he was pretty much in, uh, admiring the bandy players. And he had a vision. He thought he could turn these bandy players into great hockey players and turn Sweden into one of the best nations playing the game. Um, so after a few cups of espresso, it was pretty much settled. The three men agreed. Sweden would get started right away. But unfortunately, things didn't start off pretty well. Raul had scheduled a team tryout in which he had a bunch of cameramen come down to record the first tryout for the country. Unfortunately, the German players who he promised would come down were stuck in Germany, and the bandy players who were interested didn't show up. And Raul was pissed, so he took it upon himself to go to player to player individually and make sure that the second time they would show up. And the good news, they did. But the cameraman stayed home this time. The focus was on developing the players for hockey, and nothing else. Four months later, Sweden had its first national hockey team mostly comprised of a bunch of bandy players who wanted to transition to ice hockey, but also a couple of experienced hockey players from Germany who wanted a new adventure in a new country. They sent out this team to the first international tournament. They came in fourth. The following year, they went back to the drawing boards, put a little bit more effort into it, and got a few more players out of it. This year, they won gold, 7-4 against the Czechs. The gold medal rose the popularity of sport in Sweden, starting with the Swedish Football Federation who wanted to help hockey get its feet off the ground. With their helping hand, they started the Swedish Hockey Federation and created the first Swedish Hockey League. Many of those clubs still play today. And with the start of this first league in Sweden, it was the Swedish hockey founder, Raoul Lamott, who decided it was time in 1926 to donate the first ever hardware. They called it the Lamott Trophy. Consider this the Stanley Cup of Swedish Hockey, given to the champions of the first division. It has been used since 1926, all the way to today. Sweden was finally on the hockey map. They were on the rise. By 1938, with their impressive play and their unique uniforms, they were famously nicknamed Tre Kroner, or the Three Kings. And by 1949, their league had over 200 hockey clubs. By 1953, they won their first world championship. And according to historians, the Cold War, which started shortly after World War II and ended in the early 90s, only helped hockey culture in Sweden. It became somewhat of a, of a thing to want to watch Sweden play against the communistic bloc, especially against the Soviet Union. Those games were among the most exciting and most popular games to talk about. Unfortunately, the Soviets pretty much got the better of them 
and most of the world during that era. Um, that is until 1987, when Swedes beat them and won the world championships in 1987. Pretty much still remembered today. And in 1994, where professional athletes, everyone except for the NHL, was allowed to compete at the Olympics, that's where the Swedes really shined. Looking back at this roster, it was pretty impressive. I mean, you were looking at young players like Tommy Salo and Mats Nesland, and uh, don't forget Peter Forsberg. Coached by Kurt Lundmark, they upset Canada and went on to win their first gold medal as a country. What I think everyone remembers about that tournament, whether you were alive or not, uh, is Peter Forsberg's most insane shootout goal, in which he had faith at the goalie and brought it out to his backhand just like the previous picture showed. And with that goal, allowed Sweden to bring home the gold. And while I don't think Sweden will ever forget their first gold medal, uh, I mean, it is their national sport, uh, at least in the winter, um, it's hard to come, it's hard to be what comes next, uh, which was in 2006, Olympics in Turin, Sweden did it again. But this time, they beat Finland one of their all-time rivals. I mean, this is a neighboring country. This is a, a team uh, that they've been going back and forth with at all age groups uh, for the last like 50 plus years. And it's like their little brother, at least that's what Victor Hedman says. Um, and that's what makes it so special. And that's where I wanna dive into a discussion of what makes Sweden and Swedish hockey players so special. Because they are. They've had a ton of success in the hockey world, especially in recent years, and they're one of the most entertaining teams to watch. At least that's what I think. Now, that's partially because of the systems they build, and I will get into that in a moment, but I think it's even more important that I talk about the development. From an early age, Sweden has put an emphasis on building technical skills and hockey IQ, and focusing on that through the entire development for all of its players. I know this firsthand because as an American coach, the American developmental system under USA Hockey has adopted more of a European approach to coaching its youth players. Uh, but a lot of these drills and a lot of these uh, systems have come from Sweden. This is an emphasis on smaller drills, quicker puck moving, uh, focusing of keeping your head up, knowing what to do without the puck, and so forth. So this is uh, the foundation of it all. Now, if you want to get into the systems, like Sweden is one of the best countries to talk about. Uh, my research starts in the 60s and 70s under this guy, Tommy Sandlin, uh, who developed the 131, or what later became known as a trap, at least in the NHL. He developed this through um, inspiration from basketball. Not exactly sure how, but some sort of European basketball gave him the idea. And what this is, if you're unaware, is this. Um, it's a 1-3-1 one, one type of four check where you have one forward, three midfielders is what they would call it, and one defenseman in the back. This is a simple system, right? It's a 1-3-1, one, one, you have one forward, three so-called midfielders, and one defenseman. And the idea is that you're clogging up the midfield, uh, the midfield, the neutral zone, in order to slow down faster and fitter teams. And this is an effective system for both Sweden as well as some Swedish clubs for in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, boring, as, a, as according to some critics, but, uh, uh, but very effective, at least until the early 2000s, where this man, Hardy Nielsen, uh, was credited with creating the Swedish torpedo system, a similar trap type of game, but it was a 1-2-2 two, two, one, uh, one, two, two type of system, where you had uh, two uh, forwards, two backs and one torpedo I guess is what they would call it um, and this is also very successful especially for your gardens uh, sorry if I pronounced that horribly as well but um, it was a very effective system and uh, you see this actually being played a little bit more globally today uh, both the 131 as you very well know but also the Swedish torpedo system uh, is seen commonly not only just in the NHL sometimes but you can see it often uh, throughout Europe and some uh, American uh, high schools and travel programs have implemented that I've seen. Now I just want to finish off by saying this. 
While the Swedes have been very unique in their history of hockey and unique in the development of hockey players, as well as identified as creators for, of the 131 and the Swedish Torpedo, this is not necessarily uh, the specific way the Swedes play all the time. It's not like you're going to just see them play the Swedish Torpedo in this Olympics or the next. Um, that's you know that's very indicative of what type of coach is there and what type of players they have. Uh, but it's also important to know that with that said, what makes Sweden so spectacular is all of that. It's the combination of that. I mean, it's globalized hockey, right? It's, it's the identity that they've created throughout decades, if not uh, almost a century, of building this hockey culture in their country and uh, building smart players and uh, focusing on proper development. I mean, they've made a... A footprint into the hockey world as we know it. Like I said, I'm an American coach, and I take we take a lot of their approaches to hockey over here, and that's that. Now I just want to thank you guys for uh, watching this video, and if you liked it, please uh, please give me a like, subscribe to my channel, as I'm going to continue to do this routinely, and um, I hope you do me the favor of sharing with your friends, family, and teammates. Cheers.